purposes. So I'm going to talk mostly about MS. It's, uh, some of these concepts of neuroprotection obviously will, and you'll see, fit with other neurological diseases, but uh, this is the one that's e easiest to use as a model. So what you're seeing here is what MS lesions look like under the microscope on the right. That red circle is a blood vessel, and around it, all those dots are immune cells that are crossing through the blood-brain barrier where they're going to cause damage. And on the left is an MRI scan of someone with MS where there are a num number of these lesions. Everywhere you see this bright white signal in the brain is one of those inflammatory lesions that could be causing damage. Okay, computers may be a little slow getting off the mark this morning. So in the sequence then, this would be another vessel similar to the one you just saw with the inflammatory cells. And now you're seeing an electron micrograph of axons with myelin around them. And in the lower right-hand corner, you see uh, that black line around the axon. That's normal myelin. And to the left, or, or above it, and to the left, you see something that looks a little disrupted. That's an axon where the myelin's been chewed up by these immune cells and being engulfed by macrophages. These are scavenger cells in the nervous system. And as a consequence of that, axons lose their myelin, which is like losing the insulation on a wire. And then in some cases, the wire is cut. So you can imagine then that signals going through there, whether it be for your vision or your muscles, wouldn't work. So you might have weakness or vision loss. And at the bottom there, that green bulb is what happens when an axon is cut. And this is an animation to illustrate that for you. Go ahead and hit it for me, please. Just hit a button. And I'll so what you're seeing now is a section of uh, brain, this green and red. The red are the axons, and the green is the myelin around it. So it's like you've cut a bundle of fibers in cross sections. So these are the wires. And in the middle is a blood vessel, like we saw before. And then to the left is a normal brain MRI that you might see if this was the way the brain looked. Next. So what happens is, in response to triggers that aren't fully known, these immune cells cross the blood brain barrier, they get out into the substance of the brain, and they begin to chew up the myelin. So you can see the green being damaged by these cells. Next. And if we did a scan at this point, these bright spots would be areas of inflammation. If we give a certain contrast agent, we can make them light up. So you can see these new inflammatory lesions on the MRI. Next. Over time, this may happen again, and the edge of this lesion moves out. And now you can see in the middle, there's the fibers, the nerves, the wires, so to speak, are still there, many of them. But the myelin is gone, so the insulation's been lost in the wires. Next. And it can march out some more. And now on the scan, you might see not the whole lesion enhancing as active, but just the edge of it, like a rim. <coughs> Next. Over time, the lesions typically burn out, so they stop having active injury for a time. And last one, maybe I could get it to go here. Maybe it can't see me. Okay, so then there's this scarring. This is the sclerosis part of MS. So the brain's response to injury is to create a scar, much like a scar anywhere else in the body. And then this would be a chronic plaque that may be months or even years after the initial event. And a scan then might show this black hole. And uh, the blackness indicates that axons have been lost. This is an area where the underlying tissue has been most damaged. I just can't get this to go. OK. So the axons that are being damaged are long extensions from cell bodies that sit in the cortex of the brain. They're right on the outer surface. And they extend down through the brain and out into the spinal cord where they make connections and then out to your muscles and all the other uh, things that need to be innervated. They're up to a meter long. So these are long structures. 
They have specialized transport systems in them to move nutrients and materials up and down. And they obviously are there to conduct electrical impulses, which they do uh, very well under normal conditions. And this is a schematic diagram of what a normal axon would look like in a cartoon. So you have the cell body on the left sitting up, say, in the cortex of the brain, this long axon. And then you have these myelin sheath around it, the insulation that's actually arranged in like sausages. And the impulse that uh, travels up and down bounces from one link of the sausage to the next, which makes it fast and efficient. Next. Next. So in MS, this is part of the degenerative process. These axons are being injured. So with breakdown of the blood-brain barrier, you get invasion of these blood cells, these white blood cells into the brain and spinal cord. They create an inflammatory reaction. It's around the nerves and the axons, and it begins to damage the fibers. And so the, my the myelin insulation gets chewed up. That starts to interfere with signals getting up and down, and so symptoms may develop at this stage. But if it stops here, at least there's the possibility that the cells that make the myelin are still there, and they can under or initiate a repair process, put that myelin back around the axon, things could return basically to normal. And fortunately, that often happens in MS, especially at the early stages. It's a process that we're certainly looking at as a way we might be able to enhance. Oops. And then with enough inflammation and damage, not only would that insulation be injured, but then the axon itself could be cut. This is actually a reaction that axons undergo themselves as part of this process. Cutting the wire is more of a problem. That probably underlies disability that doesn't recover. And it would be just akin to cutting a, a wire in a telephone line. And again, uh, this is the, that section. You saw a brief view of this under the microscope. Uh, on the right, it's easiest to see where you're looking at red is where myelin is wrapped around the axons, and green is where you're seeing the wire underneath because the insulation's been damaged. And at the top, where that green bulb is, and many of them on the left, are axons that have been cut and transected. And this is what's happening in the inflammatory phase of MS. Over time, you get lesions, and I'm showing several of these uh, dark lesions. You can see where the circles are on this brain section. And if you had a pathology specimen, somebody, you could look at the brain under the microscope, you might see what's on the right. If you saw an area that was, looked normal on the MRI scan, you'd have maybe 90% of the normal axon count. That's at the very bottom. In the middle, in an area that's slightly black, you might see that up to half of the axons have been lost. And in one that's really black, many more axons are lost. So the blackness of these things tells us a little bit about how much damage has gone on in that part of the brain. Another way to look at it is a, a, an advanced MRI technique called spectroscopy, where we create this grid. You can see a checkerboard over the brain. And within each of those, we can look at metabolites that are in that area of the brain, something separate from water. And on the bottom, you see what these look like. It's a spectrum. It gives you the peaks correspond to the concentration of these molecules. And one of them, which we call NAA, this tall peak, is present in normal axons without injury. But if they're damaged, that peak goes down. And it tells us that the axons have been injured in that region of the brain. And so on the far right, in the area of a lesion, you can see that NAA peak is way down. So we have a way of monitoring the level of axon injury by MRI. We can see it in terms of the, um, the dark lesions that tell us how much damage there is. We can do things like spectroscopy that show us the metabolism is different in this injured area. There are other techniques that I'm not going to go into this morning that also allow us to assess how much damage there is in the nervous system. So what happens if your brain's losing substance and structure? Well, you lose volume, and if you lose volume, you have what we call atrophy, and that is something that can happen in MS and is another measure that kind of gives us a global look at how much injury has occurred in the brain. And here's an example of a patient with fairly active MS over a seven-year period, so this is pretty quick. Most people may not progress quite this fast. But you can see these spaces in the middle are fluid-filled spaces that are normally there, and as the brain is damaged, they get bigger and bigger, 
as time goes on from left to right. And so there, that's uh, indication, indicating atrophy and loss of brain tissue. Okay. So the immune system can cause this damage. We know that. Here's a, an interesting uh, slide showing this green line is an axon and the green circle is a T cell, one of the white blood cells that are in your bloodstream that can cross in and be part of this um, injury process. <clears throat> and it shows this T cell in contact with an axon. This is in a culture. And over a period of a little less than an hour, it initiates the cutting of that axon. So this cell is damaging this nerve fiber and then it cuts it. This is the process we want to stop. So to introduce these concepts, what is neuroprotection? It's, uh, it sounds simple, but uh, actually uh, it can get to be a little bit of a semantic issue. If uh, we cure your disease, that's neuroprotection in the best sense because you no longer have the process that's capable of causing the injury. If we can't cure it, so there's still some potential or some ongoing um, activity, maybe there are ways that we could enhance the ability of the targets of this disease to withstand the attack, to be protected from it, so that even though the inflammation is going on, more nerves would survive, fewer axons would be cut, there'd be fewer symptoms, the disease progression would be slowed down, or maybe even at best stabilized. And so that's the concept that we're trying to think about when we're thinking of neuroprotection because we don't have cures for most of the diseases we're talking about over this weekend. Neuroregeneration is an even tougher problem. That would be, okay, so the damage has occurred, now what? We, we would like to be able to repair what has been done. Your body tries to do that. The brain does have some repair mechanisms. They're actually quite robust, but they can't keep up with the continued assault from diseases like MS, and so eventually uh, it may fail. And this is where the other strategies like the stem cell research and such would come in, and we're not going to focus so much on that at all today, or in this talk. So neuroprotection has been looked at, not just in MS, but a lot of uh, diseases. Because neurodegeneration is a component of a lot of these diseases. Uh, for Alzheimer's disease, you're losing neurons and the people get problems with memory and other cognitive problems. Parkinson's disease. So there are a lot of neurodegenerative, even stroke, you're damaging uh, neurons and parts of the brain by cutting off the blood supply. So neurodegeneration is common to a lot of processes and so there's a lot of work going on in all of them that maybe converges. And so we want to be constantly aware of what's going on in these other fields. So the goal is to develop neuroprotective therapies. And to do that, you have to have some targets. So you have to understand something about what the pathology of the disease is doing that's leading to the injury. And so, again, that's why even in diseases different from the infl inflammatory diseases, like MS or transverse myelitis or, or the others that we've been talking about, even in stroke, ischemia, or neurodegenerative diseases, we're interested in what we learn about the processes that might lead us to these neuroprotective agents. So just considering stroke, ischemia means um, decreased blood flow. So it's another word for stroke. There are three, several phases of it. Here's a, the evolution of a stroke along this line. There's a period of excitotoxicity, meaning that things are released when the blood supply is cut off that are damaging to the brain substance. Those occur within minutes to hours. Then there's an inflammatory reaction that's set up and that contributes to injury. And then there's this period of where cells, depending on how much they've been injured, begin to die and drop out and, and cause the symptoms of stroke. That begins quickly and, but continues on for several weeks. So at each of these stages, it's possible that you might be able to intervene and limit the amount of damage. And many, many things have been looked at in animal models and some in humans to try and slow down that process and interrupt these cascades of injury. Unfortunately, in the area of stroke to date, we don't really have proven, robust, uh, useful neuroprotective agents that are so good that we use them all the time. So this is a list of things that have been tried. It's a partial list things like calcium channel blockers, which some people may be taking for high blood pressure, uh, 
trying to get rid of free radicals, uh, various uh, receptor antagonists you block, trying to interrupt these cascades that lead to irreversible injury and cell death, growth factors that you might introduce in various ways that can either protect the neuron or help them regenerate, uh, things to reduce the inflammatory response that's part of many of these uh, pathological things. In stroke, to date, most of these have been uh, disappointing and, and have not helped very much. Now, in Alzheimer's disease, we may be doing just a little bit better. And here are two strategies. There's a drug called memantine, which blocks a certain receptor in the brain. And it can, seems to reduce the impact of symptoms of Alzheimer's disease, and it may slow down the progression of the disease. Therefore, we think it may be functioning as a neuroprotective agent. There are other strategies like this APOE, which is a, another factor thought to be involved in the evolution of Alzheimer's disease, which didn't show any uh, specific benefit. So in Alzheimer's disease, there may be some role for neuroprotection. ALS, or Lou Gehrig's disease, we know is a difficult disease. And this is the motor neuron disease. It's what uh, killed Lou Gehrig. Uh, it rapidly progresses. Most patients don't survive more than a few years, unfortunately. So there's uh, a great emphasis on trying to find something to slow down this disease. And the problem here is we know less about ALS and its pathology and what's causing it than we do some of the others, like Alzheimer's or stroke or MS. So there is a drug called Riliazole, which is actually approved for the treatment of MS, and it seems to slow down the progression of disability a little bit, but not much. Um, it is used, uh, it's the best so far, but uh, it's certainly far away from what patients and what doctors would want for the treatment of that disease. The uh, CNTF and BDNF uh, are both growth factors. TF stands for trophic, meaning it helps cells do uh, live, uh, and uh, BDNF and CTNF can help protect neurons in various circumstances, especially in animal models, which unfortunately don't always translate to humans, but they didn't seem to help in ALS. Insulin-like growth factor is another factor that has been tested. And again, uh, one study seemed to show some benefits, the one done in North America, another study in Europe didn't, so the jury's out on that. So again, like Alzheimer's disease, there is some evidence for a modest degree of neuroprotective therapy available for a disease like ALS. Parkinson's disease has been studied for a long time, and many of the treatments for that have targeted neuroprotection as a potential strategy, and this is a list of the things that have been considered and tried. It's a very active area. Everything from uh, you know, things that you can buy at the grocery store, create creatinine, coenzyme Q, you can pick these up at the health food store, vitamin C, vitamin E, some drugs um, like selegiline and now most recently uh, were initially tested in this disease, the selegiline, because it was thought it might have a neuroprotective effect. And the patients who were on that in the study, which was done probably 20 years ago, did do a little bit better. But for the last two decades, the argument has been, was that a neuroprotective effect? or a therapeutic effect? Was it actually making the patients a little better so it looked like they were getting a neuroprotective effect? And to some extent, I think the jury's still out, but risagiline is being marketed, even though it's a similar drug, as having some neuroprotective effects. So um, it's possible that Parkinson's disease may benefit from some of these strategies. Some of the other things that are on this list are fairly simple sounding things, like minocycline is a tetracycline category antibiotic that happens to have some neuroprotective effects in animal models and in cell cultures would be obviously easy to give as a capsule. Um, we've actually used that in some patients with MS. I have no way of measuring in individuals or even three or four whether it does anything over the long term, uh, but it's inexpensive, it's safe, and to the extent that it might work, sometimes we try things. Next. So let me turn now for the last part of the talk to the issue of neuroprotection in MS. One of the first things that people are wrestling with is, 
if you interrupt the inflammatory cascade in this inflammatory process, you think that's a good thing because we attribute the damage in MS, this injury to the myelin insulation, the injury to the axon, to this inflammatory process. But it's also known that some parts of the immune reaction are necessary for not only uh, cleaning up the debris, but protecting and helping the damaged area regenerate. So if you um, have surgery or you have an injury, uh, you, you're trying to heal a wound, if you're immune compromised or you're given immune suppressive drugs, your healing is impaired. You decrease the, uh, immune, the inflammatory reaction and it actually interferes with the repair process in some ways. So the question is how far can you go in snuffing out this inflammatory response without maybe going off the other side and causing or preventing some repair that might otherwise have gone on. So we, we want to balance how we deal with the immune reaction, this inflammation, and that's why we often call it more of an immune modulation. We're trying to create the right balance between inflammation and damage and the inflammatory response that's good, that may either be protective or even be part of the repair process. And so you can divide up different factors and people are studying these things all the time. This is a very short list of what would be pages and pages of transmitters and messengers that these immune cells use to talk to each other that they release under various circumstances. Some of them are considered to be anti-inflammatory and perhaps neuroprotective. Some are pro-inflammatory and seem to drive the inflammatory response. And it's from these lists and the study of them that people get the ideas that, well, Maybe if we interfere with one or a few of these pro-inflammatory drivers, that would slow down or treat the process. Or if we were able to rev up the activity of some of these anti-inflammatory or protective factors, we might turn off a process or protect the brain and the, and the nervous system. So again, it's this balance between damage and protection that we have to consider when we're going after these neuroprotective strategies. Next. Here's one example of what you might call protective autoimmunity. In other words, a situation where some part of the immune system that's capable of causing damage is actually contributing to the protection and limiting damage in a certain circumstance. Uh, what this shows is, on the top, is kind of a cartoon of a, a rat optic nerve. So this is the nerve carrying vision signals from the eye back to the brain. And if you're studying this uh, in the laboratory, you can create an injury in it with a crush. In other words, you just drop a weight or you pinch it with some forceps and create an injury. And then you look to see how many of the nerve fibers in that optic nerve are damaged as a consequence of the injury. So in the top here, after being crushed, and you can see these little indentations where somebody pinched it, um, all these black dotted lines with the X would be vision nerve fibers that are damaged and lost, and there's one red one that managed to survive. In the bottom, they've done something that changed that outcome, so there's still some damaged lost fibers, but there's more red surviving fibers. What did they do? They took white blood cells that react to one of the components of myelin. In other words, it's an inflammatory T cell that reacts to myelin basic protein, which is one of the um, highest concentration proteins in the myelin insulation. And so this would be a T cell that would create a problem in an animal model. They put those T cells into this animal before the crush injury, and because they were there, they're, they're inflammatory, they're activated T cells, the kind that can cause injury, but they release something that protects the optic nerve from the crush injury. So it's telling us something about this protective aspect that the inflammatory response can have under some circumstances. Next. So why would this happen? Well, inflammatory cells produce growth factors. Those are one of the things we'd like to maybe have. Um, they can release inhibitory molecules that prevent some parts of the damage. Uh, they may actually be activated cells that are suppressors. So they're not driving the inflammation, but they're perhaps turning it off. And so indiscriminate blocking of all the inflammatory responses may be more than what we want to do when we're trying to control inflammatory diseases like MS and, by extension, some of the other inflammatory 
nervous system diseases that we're talking about. Next. And then the neurotrophic factors I've mentioned, these are things that are, they're responsible for growth and survival, they're there normally. Inflammatory cells may bring in more of these and enhance that survivability in the disease situation. And this is a list of, there's a long list of these growth factors. And I'm showing this because these lists, as you learn about them, you have the potential for finding strategies to increase either cells that bring these in or finding other ways to uh, create increased concentrations of growth factors in areas of injury that might be protective in the disease and prevent disability and, and injury. Now this schematic is showing you the mechanism of action of three of the approved drugs for MS. There are a few more than that and there are many more in testing. But uh, I wanted to use these to illustrate how some of them may be considered neuroprotective in their mechanism of action. So at the top, in red, it's hard to see, it says IFN beta, that's interferon beta. That would, those would be the drugs like um, Avonex, beta seron, and Rebif, which uh, you may have heard about. Those of you in the audience who have MS may be on one of those. Those drugs bind to an interferon receptor on T cells in the blood, and they do a whole variety of things, which we're not going to go into in detail, but one of the things they do is make some changes in the cells that they bind to that keep them from crossing from the blood vessel into the brain, like we were seeing earlier, cells crossing into the brain and creating this inflammatory reaction that damages myelin and axons. And so by blocking the cells from getting across, there's an X, they don't get into the brain, Central means inside the nervous system, peripheral means out in the blood. At the bottom is another drug called glutyrimer acetate, which works by a completely different mechanism. Patients inject that, white blood cells see it and react to it, and they become specific to glutyrimer acetate. It's as if they were reacting to it, it's like they've been immunized to the drug, and that changes their character. So glutyrimer acetate specific cells are a specific kind of cell called TH2, meaning they're anti-inflammatory. They tend to turn off inflammatory reactions, but they're activated cells, so they can cross the blood-brain barrier, presumably, and this is the hypothesis, is they go into an area where there's active inflammation, like in MS, and uh, as I'll show you in an experimental model, and there they release some of these anti-inflammatory messengers that turn off the inflammatory reaction, and they may even be able to carry in a growth factor like BDNF and release it, which would be protective and perhaps help protect the nervous system. So by two different mechanisms, these drugs could potentially uh, be protective, not only turning off the disease a bit, but protecting um, axons by different mechanisms. And in the middle is the latest, newest drug approved um, called Tysabri or Antigrin, or actually Natalizumab is now its name. Uh, that's given by vein once a month. In order for activated cells to cross into the brain and cause a problem, they have to bind and stick to the inside of the blood vessel. Remember, these things are flowing through the blood vessel. They can't do any damage while they're doing that. So something has to make them stick. They stop rolling through the blood channel, and then they cross the barrier into the brain and they can cause damage. So if you could keep them from sticking, the idea was uh, maybe that would be helpful in a disease like MS where you have these activated cells that you think are partly responsible for the disease. And so this is a drug, it's an antibody that's created that binds to the receptor on the blood vessel that this cell needs to hook to to stop rolling and stick. It actually binds to the cell itself, I'm sorry, and it keeps it from sticking so it can't cross, just keeps flowing around through the blood vessel and uh, it turns out that it works quite well. There are some other issues with it, but we're not going to get into that, but that strategy actually is very effective and the data for that drug were some of the best that had ever been obtained for preventing attacks of MS <coughs> and slowing down the progression of disability. So going back to this crush injury model of the optic nerve, here's a slightly better cartoon of it, which I found. So you create the crush injury, and again, you're counting the number of surviving axons going through this optic nerve before and after the crush injury. And you do this in multiple samples, and you kind of average them up. In this case, they're given the animal 
glatiramer acetate, one of the MS drugs, before they do the injury. And these two slides at the top, you see these uh, little green dots. On the left would be the one where the animal left, <laughs> the other left, where the animal did not get the drug. And the one on the right, showing you more surviving axons, is the animal that did get the glutamor acetate before the injury was created. And the bar graph show you the same thing. The red is the control. So there's fewer surviving axons in the optic nerve than the blue bar where the, pay, the uh, animals got the drug before the injury. So this is sort of similar, we think, to the myelin basic protein T cell. Remember, we transplanted T cells that were activated to one of the myelin proteins, and that was protective in a similar way. And now we're immunizing or treating with the glutamor acetate and putting those T cells into the animal. And it does a similar thing. It turns out that glutamor acetate specific T cells react to myelin basic protein in a very similar kind of way um, to be activated. So it may be the same kind of mechanism. Next. Another way to think that perhaps these drugs are slowing down the progression of the disease and being neuroprotective is to look at the atrophy. Remember, we looked at the consequences of ongoing Issue, injury to uh, nervous system tissue, axons, and the loss of those would be atrophy. The brain begins to shrink a little because it's losing some of its substance. And this is a study that looked at the progression of brain atrophy in patients in a drug study who initially spent nine months on placebo in one group and in another group were always on the drug, in this case, glutamor acetate. And between months zero and 18, that's the two bars on the far right, there's a difference. So the white bars are the patients who started off on placebo and then went on drug. And the red bars are the group that was always on the drug from the very beginning. And there's a difference so that the longer you're on the drug, the less the atrophy seemed to get worse. And that was significant enough to make us believe that it was slowing down the progression of atrophy. And we talked about the interferons having a very different mechanism of action. But a similar thing was noticed in the progression of atrophy with that. This is interferon 1A or Avonex in over a two-year period. The red bars show you how much atrophy progresses in a group that's receiving the drug and a group that's getting placebo in the first year. And you can see there's not any difference, really. So for the first year, whether you're on the drug or not, the atrophy gets worse. In the second year, in the blue, if you're on the drug, on the left, it slows down. If you're on placebo, on the right, it continues, and there's a difference. So it may be that these protective effects take some time to have their effect and to, to begin working. But over time, both of these drugs, two completely different mechanisms of action, seem to be doing something that we would like to do as a marker, perhaps, of neuroprotection and, and treating the disease, which is to prevent atrophy. So, the axon is a vulnerable structure, it can be damaged by a variety of insults, inflammation, ischemia, loss of blood supply, toxic things. The lack of myelin leaves the axon vulnerable to some of these insults, so it's more sensitive and it, it makes it harder for it to survive. In MS, at least, we think there are different kinds of injury, and each one of those uh, provides a, an opportunity to develop a drug or a treatment strategy that could interfere and improve that. And that's essentially where we're trying to get. I just can't make this go myself. So the early axon damage involves inflammatory and neurodegenerative processes. The axon damage can be prevented and protected against or maybe repaired. That were we're still working on. It's a, a little tougher problem. Prevention is preferable, so if you had your choice, you'd rather come in and have us give you something to cure the disease. You could walk out and wouldn't have to deal with it, and we're not there yet, but we'd like to be. The current treatments, which we call immunomodulators, don't, typically don't suppress the immune system as much as they begin to restore this balance between attack and non-attack, and we think that may have some role in why they work without causing um, serious side effects and problems. If you suppress the immune system too much, you begin to get 
uh, different things, adverse events, uh, infections, and who knows, a variety of other things that could be bad. And there is evidence from not only MS, but from Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, and others, that there are some neuroprotective effects that might be meaningful, uh, not only in animal models, but in humans. Next. The problem is, um, at least with a disease like MS, uh, it's hard to measure. We don't have, if you had diabetes, we'd measure your blood sugar and we can tell almost minute to minute how we're doing treating it. If you have high blood pressure, we can put the cuff on and measure your blood pressure and see how we're doing it, controlling it. In MS, there's nothing to draw in the blood that tells us whether the disease is treated well or not, whether there's going to be an attack next week or never. Uh, so we're, we're missing those markers and they're sorely needed to move this kind of research forward. It's a very important concept that we, we somehow have to get a handle on how we're going to measure disease activity so that we more rapidly test the drugs that we want to look at. And even more importantly, we want to look at combinations of drugs, and that's an even bigger problem. If you have to follow an exam that may change slowly over years, you end up um, with a study that becomes technically unwieldy and requires too many patients over too long a period of time. Um, it's just one of the barriers that face us in the MS world. Now, it's a little different on the side of things like transverse myelitis, which can occur over hours you know, to a few days. There, our problem is that we, we're playing catch up. Things are happening so fast, it doesn't give us much time to intervene and wait and watch and see. We have to begin to do things right away. You have to somehow get that inflammation down, and we have strategies for doing that. And I know you've heard about that. Um, maybe there's a room here for neuroprotective things that could be introduced immediately you know, by uh, an infusion, and, and I think those things need to be looked at. But that, the numbers now are low. We, no one center has so many of those patients, fortunately, uh, that they can have a large series and test these things. I was mentioning that you know, a combination of the agents that we have, because each one is partially effective, they don't cure the disease like MS. The thought is, of course, that if you put two of them together, you might do better. And so we need to do those studies, but they're difficult. We're hitting the immune system now in more than one way, so we can't always predict what the downstream consequences of that will be. And uh, you may know from the news and other um, talks that there have been some unusual adverse events in some of these drugs that we're testing in diseases like MS. They're powerful. They do specific things, uh, and they do them well because we design them to do them, and they actually work very well. But they also create some unintended consequences sometimes that can be um, in injury of the, in and of themselves, and sometimes um, they lead to diseases that can be fatal, different from the disease that you're treating. So we have to be cautious. You can't just throw everything in the book, everything in the bucket at uh, people with these diseases and then stand back to see what happens. And in the future, you know, of course we hope that if someone's had these diseases, they've had a stroke, they've had MS, they've had transverse myelitis or a spinal cord injury, we somehow need to get to the point where we can repair that damage and restore function. Um, we're, a lot of people are working hard on that. Um, I think it's obviously going to be difficult, but with groups like this and support, uh, maybe we'll get there in the, our lifetime. That would be great. So I'm going to stop there and pass it on to the next speaker. And thank you for your attention. <laughs>